This is an undated picture of the New Zealand philosopher and logician Arthur Norman Pryor wearing a jacket, long pants, waistcoat, school tie and a school cap. The knob on top of the cap is not visible, so Arthur may have been de-knobbed, an old rite of passage for New Zealand schoolboys. Arthur is looking squarely at the camera with a confident half-smile, and he had good reason to be confident. He was an excellent student. In fact, Pryor was the Ducks of Wairarapa High School in 1931, the school's top scholar in that year. Fast forward to 1966, where he is standing at the pinnacle of his achievements in a classroom at the University of California, teaching some of the best up-and-coming logicians such as Nino Cocchiarella and Hans Camp. The year after, he published his magnum opus, Past, Present and Future, which summed up more than a decade of work on his great invention of tense logic. Today, Pryor's achievement is widely recognized, not only in philosophy and logic, but also in computer science. Recently, researchers have stumbled upon three booklets written while Pryor was that young high school student in the picture. The booklets contain three essays on science, religion and literature, and they reveal how the philosophical problems of time shape the thinking of Pryor from his youth. His essay on science contained good illustrations explaining Einstein's theory of relativity. His essay on literature reveals his enthusiasm for the English poet Percy Bysshe Shelley. And his essay on religion displays the importance of Jonathan Edwards' theology. It comes as a surprise to scholars that the young prior, convinced by Einstein, was a determinist and believed that the dynamic phenomena of time's passage was an illusion. With Einstein, he believed that everything is determined, the beginning as well as the end, by forces over which we have no control. Pryor was drawn to the God of the Old Testament, especially to the God of Job. He was seeking a higher unity of faith based on reason and evidently hoped to be able to combine Einstein's thoughts on cosmic religion with Shelley's poetry of nature. The deterministic theology of Jonathan Edwards made it come together. He had considered himself a pro-Shelley and anti-Christian, but that changed when he read Jonathan Edwards. What has dawned upon me in the last months, he writes, is not so much that I have myself been in the wrong, as that Orthodox Christians have been, like myself, in the right. In other words, that Orthodox Christianity is a much more reasonable religion than I had previously supposed it to be. Now, he presumed, he writes, to take upon my shoulders the mantle of Jonathan Edwards. Pryor grew up in a Methodist home, with both his grandfathers having come to Australia as missionaries. Now he had, however, stumbled upon a theology that denied the central tenet of John Wesley's theology, the free will. Quite aware of the problems involved in this, he dedicated the book to his father, Norman Henry Pryor, and other Arminians who will not agree with it. With Edwards, Pryor had come to believe the following argument. 1. If God has complete foreknowledge, then we do not have free will. 2. God has complete foreknowledge. 3. Hence, we do not have free will. The problem of determinism and free will would turn out to be pivotal for his later discovery of tense logic. It led him to investigate premise one and to apply modus tollens to reach a different conclusion. 1. If God has complete foreknowledge, then we do not have free will. 2. It is not true that we do not have a free will. 3. Hence, God does not have complete foreknowledge. The discovery of the three booklets now available to scholars and the generally interested reader not only provide us with a valuable insight into the young high school students' reflections on science, poetry and religion, they constitute the beginnings of a drama of a young man who travelled from New Zealand to Oxford to discover that he had returned to the existential problems that began it all. <laughs>